say I were to come to you and I'm like, I hate your blue hair. Are you going to take it personally? I hate your blue hair. You too. Fuck your blue hair. You too. Any of you feel offended by that? Do you feel like your self-worth was attacked? No, because you're like, I don't have blue hair. That's what happens when you detach your self-worth from what people think. They could say whatever. You're like, no, I know me. I know who I am. I'm not trying to seek it through the eyes of others. I know who I am. I know I'm enough. You can say I'm not enough. That's like saying I have blue hair. I know I don't have blue hair. I know I'm enough. It doesn't get under your skin. It only does, though, if you're, what do you think of me? Is my blue hair okay? Then you're screwed. I'm sure you've all heard the saying, right? If you don't have a plan for yourself, someone else has a plan for you. Now, immediately, what are you thinking? Nah, the government, corporations, so on and so forth. No, no, no. You know who has the biggest plan for you? Past trauma. <laughs> it has a plan, and it's not a good one. And if you keep living in a reaction to that, not good. Most people, they wake up, they're immediately reactive. Wake up, reach for their phone, and boom, in your face. All the different texts, notifications, work emails, this, this, fires to put out. That's the start of your day, already in reaction. Then you get through that, then there's all the other to-do lists, and you're running this place to that place, and then you finally end your day, and you're like, maybe a little TV distraction and pass out. How is that proactive? How do you have any control over your life there? Even people's goals are in a reaction. Oh, I don't feel good enough. I need to, like we're talking about hustle and make the money and do this and do that. All in reaction. What is actually proactive in you? Again, a perspective to sink into. What is your win? If things were to go amazingly well, what does that look like? Now, to even discover that, you have to also be willing to just sit with yourself and do nothing, which most people cannot do without distractions. And this is the scary part about today's society is that you are offered an infinite amount of distractions. Infinite, just in here. There's all these amazing, and, and that's the thing, they're amazing distractions too. There's amazing shows and movies, social media, YouTube, books, podcasts, audiobooks, TikTok, Instagram, infinite amount. You could binge and binge and binge all these shows and never run out of epic shows. They're coming out every week. It can actually be very useful and helpful to carve out time where you just sit down and do nothing and even allow yourself to get bored. Because out of boredom comes inspiration. If you don't create that window of boredom, you'll never give that opportunity for that inspired spark to light up. You can also see too how drowning in distractions really robs you of any kind of creativity and imagination. Like when's the last time, if you remember, see, say even as a kid, like you played and you used your imagination, you created a storyline. When's the last time you did that? Versus do it to me, click. What about you? Funny enough, creating a bit of that boredom, hey, what about you fill it proactively? You know, even rewind time, right? Back in the day, say prior to technology and all, if you're bored, what do you do? You go out in the woods and play with a stick. And it forces you to use that imagination, to tap into it. Now you don't have to. So does this mean cutting off technology completely? Of course not. But it's that good old saying, use it, don't get used by it. It is amazing. It's a great tool but it's also a tool that can easily hijack authority over you and you become a slave to it. And it's also important to audit your life on a day-to-day -day basis and ask yourself, how often am I consuming and how often am I producing? If you're someone who also has a lot of trouble finding your purpose, it's probably because you haven't produced enough. Consuming means you're at the receiving end. You consume a movie, you consume a book, you consume an event receiving end. Even when people travel, I consume new sceneries, new places. You might even be talking to people, I consume validation. Consume, consume, consume. When are you at the cause? When are you productive? Because that's purpose. It's not consuming. It's producing. If you think of all the actions you've done in your life, what's been your favorite action? You can't say coming. That's your purpose. Or that's a good step to start identifying what your purpose is. What 
action brings you the most joy and fulfillment? And what doesn't feel like work? And that there, on a more subtle level, is your unfair advantage. People think that hustle is what makes it happen. Work ethic, discipline, no, no, no. What makes it happen is when work doesn't feel like work. And you can just go and go and go and go. That's your unfair advantage. Guess what, this here is a lot of work. Does it feel like work? No. There's even a book, and I forget the name, where it says, you can take the same task and you can put it in either the work bucket or the fun bucket. And the exact same task, if someone's doing it for fun or for pay, their experience changes completely. How much can you move in the fun bucket and crush it financially off of that? And you'll see, there's things in your life that you can just do and do and do and time flies by and it doesn't take much effort. You know, the example I always give is, as a kid growing up, you could give me a five minute, you know, say, say high school, like a five minute biology homework task. And do you know the amount of willpower and effort it would take for me to sit down for those five minutes? It felt like an eternity. There was so much dread and I sat, it was like, ugh. Then on the flip side, I was really into music back then, and I just got this editing program called Pro Tools. And I was figuring it out, I remember reading the manual. I would sit down and spend hours reading that, figuring it out, recording something, tweaking it. Objectively, way more work than five minutes of a biology task. But it didn't feel like work. That felt way more effortless. If right now, whatever your job is, or your purpose in a more career sense, financial sense is, if it feels like a lot of work, good luck. Now this also opens another whole can of worms where it could feel like a lot of work, one, because it's not your purpose and you're doing something that is out of alignment with you. But it can also feel like a lot of work when you're doing something that is aligned with you, but there's a lot of self-sabotage. <laughs> And that is something to also identify. I've seen people literally, they are in touch with their purpose, but because they're self-sabotage, they rationalize, hmm, maybe this isn't for me, and they go somewhere else. And they just dabble, 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 dabble. As opposed to, no, no, maybe this is for me, but there's something to let go of. Now, some key tells to see if it is for you, because you might hear this, like, hmm, my purpose. I, I don't know, let me try anything and everything. No, no, no. Look into your past for clues. They're there. You've had X amount of time alive, to gather data, trial and error. If you look in your past at what you liked and what you didn't like, there's data there that you could say narrow the lane forward. So if you don't know what your purpose is now, you're like, I don't know. It's like trying to figure out, say, what your favorite ice cream flavor is. Say you look at all the flavors there and someone's like, pick one. They're like, well, I don't know, maybe this one? No, look in your past. If you tried, for example, vanilla ice cream in your past and you didn't like it, it rules out all the vanilla ice cream. And any ice cream that has vanilla in it. If you tried pistachio and you didn't like it, it rules out anything with pistachio. And what happens, the lane gets more and more narrow, and that's what you can play in to figure out what really clicks with you. If you look at your past, look at what you liked. Look at what you didn't like. See if there's some patterns there. And you'll see little clues that narrow the lane moving forward. For me, guess what? I talked about music, Pro Tools. That was my passion and purpose from the age of 12. On a more personal level, it was also the only way I could express myself back then. I was, had massive social anxiety, couldn't put myself out there, couldn't talk to anyone, but I could express myself through music. I even did shows and stuff growing up and on stage doing the show, couldn't talk, but it was like, I could finally be me and kind of uh, unleash that stifleness, that cage that I was in. So I loved it for that, but I also loved all the aspects of it. I loved the creative side. I loved the composing side. I loved the self-expression side. I liked the impact that it has on people, the impact music overall had on me. I loved the Pro Tools. I loved the editing. What am I doing here today? This is the concert. What are the videos you see online or in products? Those are the albums, those are the songs I record. The editing of the videos, that's the editing like Pro Tools, but it's videos. The creative side is the same thing, right? You'll see me work on little bits here and there, tweak this, test it, oh, let me explain this concept like that. Hmm, there was a question. How do I 
explain the same concept while incorporating this question in the future so the question doesn't arise, and I compose. And in the end, okay, here's the finished explanation here. Let's record it, here's a video. There's a song. So it fulfills the same thing, the, the, the clues are there. Now this also means don't get too myopic though. If I was just like music only, it would block off other opportunities that fulfills those same needs, that same authentic drive. So once you identify the thing, go deeper. What about that thing resonates with me? And what are some other avenues that do the same? But this is key. And if you don't have goals and you don't know what it is, then your purpose is to find your purpose. Because it is not healthy to not have goals and not have a direction. What's not having a goal? It's like playing a video game where there's no missions, no point. So you finish the game and you're just kind of free roaming in the end. What happens after a while? You get so bored. But what can you do though in the end? You can then come up with your own missions to spice it up. Just kind of missions for fun. Hmm, let me see if I can get to, to the woods really fast. And you run to the woods as an example. That's a fun little mission you created. Now what do those missions and goals do? It's not about getting to the woods, <laughs> weirdest example, go to the woods. It's not about getting to the woods. It's not about the outcome. It's not about achieving those goals. It's that having a goal, an authentic goal, enhances the process. The process without a goal, not good. So you do need goals, but the goal enhances the process and the process is where the value is at. The process is what it's about. You can also sink into perspectives that eliminate the outcome. If you were to fail at everything, what would you do? Key question. If you were to fail, and it's all about just doing it for the sake of doing it, what would be that thing you would choose to do? For me, even moving to LA, it was for music at first, I sat down, I'm like, look, there's a chance I might be homeless and never make it. Is it worth it? Yes. I'd rather fail at doing something that I love versus succeed at doing something that I hate. You can ask yourself, if you have all the money in the world, what would you do? Can't make more, you have it all. If you have all the validation in the world, what would you do? Can't get more, you have it all. And then from those perspectives of eliminating the outcome, it can get you in touch with that inspiration, the process. Still have goals though, but temporarily sinking into that can bring up some good data. And lastly, the other big way to bring up some big data is to do, um, and it sounds a little dark, what I call a death meditation. Reflecting on your own mortality and your own death. If you think of even resistance, which you saw in some of the examples here, we do that and we stuff things down in order to survive. And even bringing some stuff up into our awareness it feels like we're going to die. The same survival instinct that made you suppress and repress it gets activated again and it's oftentimes compounded and amplified from time and just more and more energy into it. Now, if you hold all that down and the information of what runs you in order to survive, that's why resistance is there, if you're able to actually convince yourself that you're dead through a death meditation, there's no longer the need to resist all that. Right? If you're stuffing it down to survive, but you've convinced yourself, well, I'm dead, it actually eliminates a lot of resistance and a lot of authentic data surfaces. Personally, I do this once a month. It aligns me with what's true to me. And I do it as a good audit as well to see if my ego seeped in. Did my ego oh, kind of steer me off? Because it'll seep into the, especially the more you let go, very authentic things and just deviate it a little bit. Or if I'm faced with a major life decision, I'm like, hmm, this or that, I don't know. Death meditation, gold is always there. And it's not about, you know, people think, oh, death meditation, living in fear, it's about aligning yourself with reality.